It is the start of turn three, the beginning of summer in this particular year, year zero of the Ascension Wars, and we have had our first battle. So I mentioned last turn that the way battles work is essentially you plan your movements for the first five turns of what is effectively a large real-time strategy battle, and then the AI runs the rest of the battle for you. I'm not going to check every battle against independence because it's not usually worth paying attention to, but this one I will do that just to show how it all works. So as you can see, here's the overview. We took zero losses and we killed every single one of the independent troops living in this province. So let's take a look so that we can see how well our scripting did against these independents and see if there's any obvious mistakes that we should uh, remove, anything else we should iron out. As you can see, our javelins hung around throwing javelins until they ran out of javelins, then ran up to join the melee infantry guys up at the front who had already finished breaking the morale of the wolf tribe melee guys. And then they just sort of marched across the rest of the map, crushing them as they went. This is what tends to happen when you're expanding with giant infantry. Um, it's scary. It's scary when giants are marching towards you. That should show why I'm not generally going to bother to watch my uh, my expansion battles. Some people watch every single battle, but um, that seems unnecessary to me. I'll probably only watch these battles if, I, if I've made a mistake and want to see what it was. And I'll probably watch a lot of battles with other players when we eventually start having conflicts, because you can learn a lot about what your opponent is doing by how they've scripted and equipped their units. So we're still in early turns, so there's very little to do with our actual strategy. Let's just take a look at what we've achieved so far. We've taken one province, which turned out to have an arena building in it, which gives us a bonus of 25 gold per turn. That's quite a nice find. I was going to march straight south and take this incredibly valuable province, but it's pretty well defended. Knights hit very hard. So what I will do is hold off on it and come back to it on a later turn. With a bit of luck, no other player will be able to grab it. The underwater player is going to probably focus on finishing expanding underwater before he steps on land at all. And uh, this is closer to me than it is to any of the other players on the other sides, which means I have a strong chance of taking it even if I don't grab it this early. I could march into this very lightly defended province and take it, but instead I'm going to head up here. Because this province is adjacent to my uh, capital, that means that if I take this province, I can recruit more troops here because of the way that resources work, which I explained last turn. This army should have no trouble taking this province, so I'm happy to just move them on and up and around. I'm instead going to try and head to here and take this one. When they move into this province, I'll probably send troops from here to, to link up and then they can go on together. It's important to adapt your strategy as you go to match the things you discover and things that happen, you know, have a plan and stick to it. But if that plan isn't going to work, don't pointlessly throw your troops away fighting these guys because there's not a 0% chance they would win this fight, but it's not, it's not perfect. It's not great. Missing your expansion early is quite bad. Generally, you want to take more than one province per turn after the first couple of turns which is why the Awake Expander archetype of Pretender is so strong. But we didn't take one of those, we've taken a Researcher. Which is as good a time as any to talk about research. So you can tell anyone who has any kind of magic paths to do research, and they will start generating an amount of research per turn based on how many points of magic they have across their different paths. While the eight paths of magic are what dictate which spells a spellcaster has access to on the personal scale, the research is what dictates what you have access to as a nation overall. Research is divided with a different system of these different schools of magic. Generally speaking, all of these have all the different elemental and sorcery paths hidden in them. Except for blood magic, which is all only in the blood magic tree, including ones that mix with other magic types. Magic research costs are exponential, so uh, it takes 50 to get to level 1, 100 to get to level 2, 200 to get to level 3, 400 to get to level for 800 to get to level five, etc., etc., etc. So to get the late game spells at, you know, seven, eight, and nine, it's costing you a vast amount of research points. For that reason, it's important to identify spells that will be critical to your strategy later on and try and dig towards those specifically. One we want to get is Horde of Skeletons, which is a powerful necromancy spell. We have good necromancers, so we're going to be relying on summoning a lot of skeletons in combat. One thing I should mention while I'm talking about it is that another way spells are divided is into ritual and combat spells. Ritual spells are cast on the uh, campaign map by, by spellcasters occupying their whole turn, whereas combat spells are cast in combat. Ritual spells tend to have long-term or permanent effects, whereas combat spells usually only last for the length of the combat. So Horde of Skeletons will summon a lot of skeletons during combat, but those skeletons will fall apart at the end of the battle, whereas... 
something more like in case you can't tell i couldn't find the spell i was looking for in all this it's here somewhere there are hundreds and hundreds of spells in the game it's a pain to find what you need anyway so yeah we'll be digging for level five of enchantment so that we can unlock horde of skeletons to summon so many skeletons just just a ridiculous number of skeletons a frankly unfair number of skeletons so far we've recruited two of our magi these are these are Gigia, or Gigias, I suppose is the plural, which are our giant crones. With a bit of luck, we'll get a few different uh, death ones, which are which are very effective. So far, we've got one with the nature bonus, one with the death bonus. It's likely that we'll get a one with two blood at some point, and uh, hopefully we'll get some astral ones later on as well. These are all different, use, differently useful for different things. So in addition to that, we're topping up our recruitment. You always want to be recruiting as much as possible, especially during the expansion phase. Generally speaking, you should be trying to run your treasury with a balance of zero. You should be reinvesting everything you make every turn. So that's going to be it for this turn. It is now turn four, and as you can see, our research is still going strong. We've also received a pro proclamation from Marignan. He's waited a turn to declare his profit one turn slower than everybody else. That's probably because he wanted to recruit a better commander to use as his profit. And there are quite a few reasons why you might want to do that. You might want to get a higher level priest, or you might want a stronger chassis for combat, for example. I'm going to assume that his god is... Um, Either the Baphomet, which is a uh, burning skull, or the Divine Word, which is a, a giant word made of fire. <laughs> We've also got another battle. I'm not going to bother watching this one. It's it's fairly clear what happened. It would be pretty much the same as watching the previous one. However, we did lose one of our Ulfedna, which is a, um irritating expense, because they're quite expensive in gold. I recruited those guys because I had just enough resources for them, but not enough for more javeliners left over. As you can see, these guys are 70 gold, but only 5 resources. Whereas the javeliners are 30 gold and 17 resources. But I suspect I might have been better off just saving my gold. The thing is, they don't have shields. I think this is the first time I've had a look, where you guys can see it, at the actual stats in the game. All of these stats affect a ton of different things. They are all important, they all interact with all sorts of different things in different ways. When I talk about how complex and granular this game is, just bear in mind, like, the age of your troops. Your individual troops on the battlefield, not even just your commanders, is important to keep in mind. Encumbrance, fatigue, protection, it's like having an entire army composed of individual D&D characters in terms of the amount of stats you have to manage. Anyway, I like these guys in the abstract because they have access to regeneration, which is a useful ability. However, they don't have shields, which means that they tend to just go down in a hail of arrow fire, whereas almost everybody else we have has shields and are therefore just ultimately more resilient. So we uh, managed to take this pretty, pretty reasonably. And this turn, we're actually going to have one of our mages bring some support troops over here. This is kind of a waste of a mage this early on because you want them all to be doing research or spellcasting or even sight searching which I'll explain later. However I don't have any spare commanders and I can't spare a turn of recruitment at the capital to get a, a military commander because I can only recruit a couple points worth of commanders per turn and I need all those points to be channeled into making wizards. So I won't go over the scripting I'm giving these guys uh, but that should work out next turn and then they can push on straight into this province afterwards. And sooner or later we'll stick up a fort there and then uh, that'll be a second recruitment centre as well. But before that, why don't we have a quick look at the other pretenders in the game? If you go to statistics, there's a variety of things you can find out. Most of the time you only get information about your own nation unless you have successfully infiltrated spies into your enemy's uh, capital provinces, which it's that kind of game. But one thing you can do is see all of the pretender gods in the world and all of the nations that they're attached to. I will talk about what these nations are, what they're based on, what their themes are, what they do, as and when we meet them, when they start to actually show up. But until then, let's just look at the list. We've got this guy who's clearly role-playing. We've got a couple of generic names. People tend to, if they're not going to indulge in the tradition of having a joke name, they tend to just uh, pick whatever their, their usual screen name is. But we've got Help Our Own Fire, Scaly Scales, which implies to me that this is probably a pretender focused on having, having good scales for their dominion. I, myself, and me, which gives away that this is almost certainly a triple deity, which can operate as three separate units on the on the world map. Know it all is prob probably a research focused pretender like me. Garbage pretender, I choose you. I have <laughs> I have no idea. That would be an amazing bluff if it turned out they'd actually built something incredible. So those are the uh, opponents that we have to consider. But yeah, so apart from continuing our expansion, the only thing I really want to talk about today is my actual array of units. 
So we have two types of units generally. We have the Veti, which are little goblin guys. These are size one, which means that you can fit six of them into a single combat map tile, which is important for reasons I will go into later. The rest of my guys are Jotun, which are giants who are size four, which means you can only fit one of them per tile. One of the fun things about Dominions is that it has a huge amount of uh, different troops in the game and different commanders. Most nations will have at least this many. Some have many, many more. Some have a few less. And they're all very, very slightly different and do very slightly different things and have different purposes. But to go over them in brief, I have tiny goblin archers, tiny goblin spearmen. I'll basically never be using these guys. Tiny goblin wolf riders. These are actually very good. They're quite weak, but they're cheap and they're very fast. They're much faster than most cavalry, in fact, which means that they can be used for flanking maneuvers much more effectively than people might expect. We also have moose riding cavalry, which is actually an archery unit. Their main benefit is that they is that they, <laughs> the little goblin guys riding on the back of the moose will shoot a lot of arrows and be hard be hard to kill, compared to most uh, compared to most archer units. However, I don't expect to use these very much. Then we've got a significant array of different Jotun infantry guys. Bondi will probably never use. They are basically just farmers who've been recruited to the battlefield. Javeliners we're using for our expansion because the thing about a giant throwing a javelin is that it's the size of like a horseman's lance. It hurts a lot more than an ordinary javelin, which itself hurts a lot more than an arrow. So these guys are actually kind of super deadly. If we click here, we can see they only have two javelins each, which would be a problem if not for the fact that the javeliners are competent melee guys in their own right. So they will do a couple of rounds of shooting, which will do a lot of damage, and then can actually hold their own in melee afterwards. Hurlers are supposedly our proper ranged unit, but we'll basically never be using them as such. They do a ton of damage, but they have very short range because they throw giant rocks. As is appropriate to giants. The main thing we'll be using them for is to siege castles. They have a siege bonus of five, which is quite a lot. Um, and being giants, they're already quite good at sieging castles. So when we start trying to take opponents' forts, we'll be using stacks of these guys to bust the walls down quite quickly. Then we have our actual, like, guys. We've got spearmen and axemen, which are self-explanatory. We've got the um, Godi Huskal, which have bodyguard, which is an interesting, interesting trait that I'll explain right now. The way that bodyguard works is that if an assassin tries to assassinate a commander, there is a chance that troops under the command of that commander will be present during the assassination. And the way the assassination itself works is a mini combat, just like a battle between armies, except that the only people who are present are the assassin and the commander being assassinated and any of those troops under that commander's command who happen to show up. The bodyguard trait makes them more likely to show up during the assassination. So it's quite useful if you think you're going to be assassinated but they're also just stronger infantry. They're a lot like my ordinary javeliners, except just more powerful and more expensive. We also have the Huskal, who are the same, but only only axe guys, no javelins. And the Heardmen, who are probably the best infantry. Again, they have bodyguard, but their main benefit is that they're just very strong sword infantry. The Ulfhednar, which I've mentioned, are these guys. Supposedly, they should be pretty good because unlike everybody else, they have regeneration, which means they'll regain hit points every turn. And regeneration also makes them less likely to take afflictions, which are permanent wounds. However, again, because they don't have a shield, they're just so vulnerable to arrow fire that the regeneration tends not to matter. Finally, we have our Thrymshirding, which are our only sacred troops. Since I have neglected to take a bless, which is very unusual, but um, I think will pay off for this game I hope we'll pay off for this game. Um, we won't be using them very much, at least not in the early game. The main benefit of these guys is that they're very they're strong melee infantry, but they also have ice protection, which gives them bonus armor in cold provinces. And of course, then they'll have the benefit of your bless when if you have a bless. <laughs> so those are the guys we'll have on the battlefield. To just go over the commanders as well, in very quick, we have... These guys, who are actually very effective scouts, will probably be using them to scout because they have a lot of map movement. They can travel very across several provinces in one turn, but they are stealthy, so other players can't see them do it. These are our ordinary scouts. They are equally stealthy, but a lot slower. Also sacreds, which I didn't realize before. That's surprising. Uh, then we've got assorted different uh, war leaders. These guys have different stats and are different uses, essentially, but, you know, they can lead troops. That's the important thing. Then we've got Veti Hags, which are our only goblin spellcasters. They're very weak and they're bad at research, but because we can recruit them in forests without having to build a fortress there, 
we can just essentially boost our research massively by recruiting a vast number of incredibly cheap, shitty little goblin wizards to sit there researching forever. So that's going to be a priority. We have our Gigia, who we've already already mentioned, are just extremely solid spellcasters and what we'll be using for the most part. We, then we also have the Scrati, who have access to different paths. They start with water magic, blood magic, and have a random chance of one of the same paths that the, uh, the Gigia have access to. However, these guys are actually really competent melee guys, and they have the ability to transform into giant wolves. Which means that later in the game, we'll be using these for a couple of different tactics. We'll be using them to become incredibly powerful single combatants, and we will also be using them uh, essentially as a battery to fuel other spellcasters' spellcasting with a tactic called Turbo Communions that I'll explain later. We have the Thromsgurda, who are essentially the boss guys of the of the Thrums Hearding, and are probably our most effective priests. They're level 2 priests, so we'll have to have a few of these later on. And then finally, there is the uh, Jan Vidya, who are essentially upgraded versions of the Gigias. They are much stronger spellcasters, but they start with old age, which means that they are already taking massive penalties and have a chance of getting sick and slowly dying every single turn. We'll probably want to get a few of these eventually. So that's the overview of my nation. Only took us, what, four turns to get there? And uh, that's everything I want to talk about this turn. Friends, it is turn five, and today we're going to take a risk. So first off, let's look at how this battle went. As I predicted, it went completely fine. In fact, let's do this one. I won't normally be viewing these, as I've said, but I do want to see how well my tactics worked. So as you can see, we caught the, the charge and they, they just shredded the guys, but But my Vati have in fact done exactly what I wanted them to. They looped around the back, killed a commander, and then uh, looped back in. That's pretty much what they're for. If you can hit the back line, you can usually kill commanders, which will uh, be very effective in most battles. Ironically, I killed this commander late enough that it didn't really matter. These guys had already killed everybody else. But uh, the death of a commander is likely to cause morale damage, which it makes a unit more likely to flee. In fact, there are quite a few different ways to win a battle in Dominions. Obviously, you can kill all of your opponents, sure, but you can also break their morale, or break the morale of keystone components of whatever their strategy is, or you could, for example, cause so much damage that what is known as a HP route occurs, which is where a sufficient amount of hit points have been lost by one side that they start to flee, even if they're still actually winning the battle, uh, and so on and so on. There's many other ways you can do it. You can f cause your opponents to... Uh, become so fatigued they can no longer fight, etc, etc. Very simple plan for today again. We are continuing to research in the capital and recruit units, but we're going to take a bit of a risk this time. I'm hoping that this army is strong enough to conquer this province. If it's not, that's going to be a serious and lengthy setback for us. In fact, I'm tempted to bring Hilda home. However, I don't have enough squads under this commander in order to be able to have these as three separate squads. I could incorporate my spearmen into my javeliners and then they just stand around doing nothing for the first couple turns until the javeliners start to attack in melee, but I think I'm going to give this a try. This is arguably a waste, if, even if this is successful, this is arguably a waste of a wizard's turn, but um, we're going to do it anyway and see what happens. So since we have nothing else to talk about, this gives me the opportunity to bring up a couple of things I've forgotten. One is that uh, I've been moving my scout across the map slowly as we go. I've now had a look at what's in this throne province. This is the icon for a throne. Don't forget we need to capture a certain number of those in order to win the game. This one's very heavily defended. Based on the units in it, we can make some guesses as to which throne this is. This might be a throne of Gaia or possibly a throne of Summer. I forget the exact details, but um, yeah, so that probably won't be taken for a long time into the game. Not until the mid to late game some will people tr start trying to assault this province. Surprisingly, we haven't run into any other players yet. There should be another player's capital province in here. You'd think that we'd see some of his stuff by now, but this scout should run into him fairly soon. Incidentally, it's a good idea to see if any of your independent provinces can recruit scouts. This one can. I can't spare the gold right now, but it will definitely be worth recruiting some independent scouts soon. Related to that, there's a couple more terrain types over here that we haven't seen yet. We have swamps, which have very low income, but have good magic sites, and caves, which again have low income, but have very good resources, much like a forest. These are relevant because they're just more terrain types that some 
nations care about and some nations don't. For example, if you are, you know, underground dwelling bat people, you probably care about cave provinces. If you are lizard men, you probably care about swamp provinces. Disregarding that, it's probably worth taking this province at some point because lizard man provinces will get us access to quite cheap Astral One mages, which we can recruit en masse for shenanigans. The other thing I forgot to talk about is what this big yellow border on our map is. This is the limit of our dominion. So in dominions, there are essentially two forms of control of a province. There's your sort of direct physical control. So I control this, 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 and this. These are provinces that I have conquered and currently own and are currently paying me taxes. I can recruit troops in there, I can build things in there, etc, etc. Within this yellow border, my godly power is dominant, which is good for me and bad for everybody else. This influences a bunch of different things, but primarily uh, at the moment it'll be to do with spreading our scales. But there are things like, for example, your god automatically blesses themselves in, inside of your dominion. Uh, there's various other effects that it has. And if you have no dominion anywhere, you are out of the game. So as you can see, my, my divine influence has been spreading a lot further and faster than my physical influence, which I'll want to try and uh, speed up soon. So in this province, I am recruiting a raiding party of uh, wolf riders. Hopefully, I'll be able to get enough of them soon that I can take this province with a secondary army. This is an incredibly lightly defended province, so it should be a pretty easy grab. Incidentally, there's a few different ways to expand your dominion. Your god and your prophet both generate a, a check, a dice roll, uh, to see if they, go they can raise dominion in one of your provinces every turn. Additionally, temples do that, and also you can tell priests to pray, which gives them a chance of raising dominion. Certain forms of raising your dominion will reach certain caps, and there is a maximum level that your dominion can reach, which I believe is based on your, your, your god's base dominion. We started with four, if I remember correctly, which means that we basically have a cap of four that that praying can raise it to. But we don't actually have any priests apart from our prophet at the moment, so that's not really relevant. When you start running up against other players' territories, the sort of existential battle of uh, pushing your divine influence into one another's territories can be quite interesting, especially if, for example, your dominion generates cold weather and they are lizard people who don't like being in the cold. Anyway, I think that's everything we're going to talk about for this turn. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.